Welcome to the Play Podcast with me, Douglas Schatz. Hello, and welcome to episode 72 of the Play Podcast, where I explore the greatest new and classic plays. I'm Douglas Schatz, founder and host of the Play Podcast. The curtain rises on the sitting room of a rambling country house in rural England in 1773. The squire and his wife, Mr. and Mrs. Hardcastle, are in the midst of what is a much rehearsed argument between them about the relative merits of a quiet life in the country versus the fopperies and fashions of the town. Mr. and Mrs. Hardcastle have few visitors, living here in Liberty Hall with their 18-year-old daughter, Kate, Mrs. Hardcastle's son, Tony, who is not quite 21, and their orphan niece, 18-year-old Constance, all of whom, for their own reasons, are keen to come of age and fly this nest. They will shortly play host to two gentlemen who have traveled from the city to make their acquaintance, a visit which will set spinning a merry-go-round of romantic intrigues, complete with mistaken identities, stolen jewels, and a midnight coach ride that ends mired in a horse pond. This is the sentimental, or laughing, comedy and social satire that is Oliver Goldsmith, She Stoops to Conquer. She Stoops to Conquer premiered at Covent Garden Theatre in March 1773, and for the past 250 years has been a staple of English language theatre programs and educational curricula. As we record this episode, a sparkling new production is on stage at the Orange Tree Theatre in Richmond-upon-Thames, and I'm delighted to be joined today by its director, Tom Littler, who is perfectly placed to tell us why this play has proved so enduringly popular. Welcome to the Play Podcast, Tom. Thanks for joining me. Thank you very much. Before we get started, a proper introduction to Tom. Tom Littler is the artistic director of the Orange Tree Theatre, having taken up the post this year. His first production as director being a revival of Somerset Mom's The Circle, before the current She Stoops to Conquer. Before this, Tom was artistic director and executive producer at the German Street Theatre in London for five years to 2022, during which he won several awards, including the Off West End Award for Best Artistic Director. Tom has directed over 70 productions, which of course are too numerous to quote here, but a selected list of which we'll include on our website. He has an English degree from Oxford, as well as postgraduate degrees from the Open University and the University of Cambridge. And here is the clincher for our purposes today. As if any more were needed, he has also taught 18th century literature at Cambridge. So there's no doubt that he's qualified to talk us through She Stoops to Conquer. Thanks again, Tom. It's an honor to have you with us. Pleasure. Thank you very much. So having referred to its enduring popularity, my first question has to be, what attracted you to want to produce this 250-year-old play now? Well, it's an unusually generous play, I would say. It's a play that thinks well of human nature. It has an edge to it, and it holds a couple of its characters up to the light and invites us to laugh at them and, and their follies and their vices. But fundamentally, it's a play that thinks well and generously and optimistically of humans and their capacity to change and grow. And, and I thought that would be a good spirit for the Christmas season. Quite a nice antidote to the times we live in in some way, isn't it? I had to go back and do some research about the play, obviously, and Oliver Goldsmith. Can you tell us a bit about the author? I gather that from what I've read that he had quite a colourful, picaresque life, didn't he? Goldsmith is one of literature's most endearing figures, I suppose. He's of Irish stock. He comes to England in, um, I guess, the 1740s or, or thereabouts, you know, into the heart of bustling Georgian London. You know, this is really the era of the coffee house. This is the era of the culture of politeness, which is extremely important in, in She Stoops to Conquer. It is increasingly the era of the sentimental novel, which maybe we'll talk about later on. And Goldsmith joins this thriving literary scene as one of its more minor but loved figures. He's friends with Dr. Johnson. He's friends with Boswell. He's friends with that whole crowd of people who together form an institution that they call the club, which meets quite regularly in a room above a pub, and they get together and chew the fat on all matters literary. It's not really a political 
movement. It's an artistic and literary and gossipy movement that sort of slightly sets itself apart from the quite frenetic politics of Georgian England. And Goldsmith is moderately successful. He does okay. He writes some kind of popular history books. He writes a long poem called The Deserted Village, which is important in thinking about She Stoops to Conquer because The Deserted Village is about the erosion of countryside life. It's an elegiac poem, in a sense, mourning the slow decline of kind of countryside morality as town manners and morals encroach. And as quite literally, the agricultural revolution means that the countryside, as people knew it, was being radically reformed and turned into a kind of effective capitalist system with consequent losses. That's his first big hit. He writes a play called The Good-Natured Man, which does all right. He writes a novel, The Vicar of Wakefield, which is still read or at least still studied today. And he kind of rattles along through life, (laughs) bumping from one financial crisis to another, always spending too much on his clothes. Clothes are referenced (laughs) quite a lot in She Stoops. Always getting into debt, having frantically to deliver the next thing to get himself out of debt again. And at some point in his life, so he claims, and we should probably be open in Goldsmith to questioning his veracity, but uh, he claims that he goes on a country weekend where he stops off at a at a pub and at the pub he inquires after his destination and they say oh no you'll you'll never make it not in this weather why don't you stop off at the nice old pub at the top of the hill and he stops off there for the night and he orders his dinner and he goes to bed and he thinks it's quite a nice room actually and in the morning he has his breakfast and he asks for the bill And it's only at the moment when he's been very insistently asking for the bill that he realises he's been staying at his original destination all (laughs) along and treating it like a hotel. And that is, of course, the origin story for the the central prank in She Stoops to Conquer. I read somewhere that critics thought that that whole story in the play was implausible, but of course it really happened to him. So he had that card to play in response. Yeah, he was quite a character, as I understand it. As you say, he was apparently addicted to gambling, but also naively charitable with his money. So he was forever in debt. It took him a while, I believe, to settle to a career in literature. He actually, at one stage, he was traveling around Europe, busking by playing his flute before he pitched up in London. And then, as you say, one of the um, founding members of this exclusive club, which only had 12 members, I think, initially, with Sir Joshua Reynolds being one of them, Samuel Johnson another who became a bit of a patron of his. And there's a wonderful story, which actually I can't resist just reading a little bit of, which I'm sure you know from Johnson when he had written The Vicar of Whitefield, which he referred to. And it gives a bit of a glimpse, I think, into Goldsmith's life. This is Johnson saying, I received one morning a message from poor Goldsmith that he was in great distress. And as it was not in his power to come to me, begging that I could come to him as soon as possible, I sent him a guinea and promised to come to him directly. I accordingly went as soon as I was dressed and found that his landlady had arrested him for his rent, at which he was in a violent passion. I perceived that he had already changed my guinea and had a bottle of Madeira and a glass before him. I put the cork into the bottle, desired he would be calm, and began to talk to him of the means by which he might be extricated. He then told me he had a novel ready for the press, which he produced to me. I looked into it and saw its merit told the landlady I should soon return, and having gone to a bookseller, sold it for £60. I brought Goldsmith the money, and he discharged his rent, not without rating his landlady in a high tone for having used him so ill. I don't know how true every detail of that is, but it gives us a little bit of a glimpse of the kind of hand-to-mouth existence he might have been living, as you described it. It's a lovely story, isn't it? And there's something in that about generosity, I suppose, isn't there? There's something there about the willingness to accept our friends and our friendships as flawed, rackety, messy human things. Oh, that's a lovely sentiment. Yeah. And that's there in the play as well, isn't it? And of course, he dedicated She Stoops to Johnson, didn't he? Talking about sentimental I've read that Goldsmith himself wrote an essay shortly before this play premiered in which he attacked the prevailing theatrical style, what he called weeping sentimental comedy, and called for a revival of laughing comedies. You would have hoped that comedies would be laughed at rather than wept in any case. But what did he mean by all this? 
Yes. When we talk about sentimental writing in this period, it's it's a little bit different from how we use the word now. The sentimental novel and sentimental writing, and to be indeed a man of sentiment, there's nothing pejorative in that term. It means that you are someone of fine feeling. If you're a man of sentiment, that is a good thing to be. It means that you are someone who is sensitive, sensible of the feelings of other people. It means that when you see people suffering, it moves you. It means that, you know, if you see a lady crying, you might try to help her. If you see someone that's poor, you might stop on the street and try to help him out. And it means a culture of fine, refined feeling. So why would he attack that then? Yeah, it's an interesting it's an interesting question. So he he writes into that tradition in part in his novel The Vicar of Wakefield. The Vicar of Wakefield has been interpreted variously as a sentimental novel or as a satire on the sentimental novel. It oscillates between moments where you take it seriously, moments where you go surely he's going too far and this has become sort of like you've had too much milk chocolate and then moments where you go oh no he's definitely taking the mickey out of this whole thing and it's a novel that manages to have its cake and eat it it is basically a satirical novel it's a sort of a little playful attack on the conventions of sentimentalism but at the same time it enjoys the tropes It enjoys the idea of somebody weeping for somebody suffering and so on and so forth. She Stoops has many of those same qualities. For much of the play, it pokes fun at sensibility. It has references to novels more than once. You know, Mrs. Hardcastle at the end says, oh, this is all but the whining end of a sentimental novel or modern novel, I think she says. Elsewhere, Constance says to her friend Kate, are you all right? Are you okay? Or has the last novel been too moving? (laughs) Do you look so pale because the goldfish have died? You know, (laughs) so there is this kind of playful thing around whether people are too overly buffeted by the exposure to other people's emotions. So all the way through, it takes up its stance as his famous essay would posit as a sort of anti-sentimental comedy. But then in the final 20 minutes, half an hour, as he brings the lovers, Kate and Marlowe, closer together and their very peculiar romance begins to be resolved, he absolutely writes into the tradition of sentimental writing and the love language with which he endows Marlowe when Marlowe becomes a more articulate man could be lifted straight from the middle of a sentimental novel of this period. So he likes to have both. He likes to have his fun and have his romance. It's a curious thing when he writes that essay and says, you know, let's replace sentimental comedies with laughing comedies. And we go, well, surely all comedies should be laughed at. Not really so. There were quite a lot of plays being put on in this period that were highly successful that actually are not funny and are not really intended to be funny. They are comedies in the sense that they end happily and good prevails and people get married at the end. And that is what makes them comic. But they are not comic because you laugh. They're comic because of those happy romantic endings. And what they most of all dramatise is this culture of fine feeling. It's Goldsmith's position in the essay. Let's bring back some of the more robust satirical element and let's have a comedy that laughs at vice. Let's have some characters who have vices. And that is the true task of comedy is to hold those people up to the light and laugh at them. There are people who have said that the whole essay is really just a publicity stunt. Yeah. Because, in fact, the playwriting tradition that he is writing into is much more complicated than he would have you believe. There are plenty of funny plays. There are plenty of plays in this period that are doing exactly what he's doing in She Stoops. But there is something genuinely original, I think, about She Stoops, if not quite so sort of drums and trumpets as the introduction would have us believe. Oh, that's a great summary. So he he basically has his cake and eat it too, as you said. But it sounds like not a bad thing to put more laughter into comedy. But it's not as radical as all that, I suppose, in the end. But for listeners who are not familiar with the play or have not had the pleasure of seeing your production yet, could you give us a, a short summary of the plot of the play? 
Yeah, I mean, essentially, like many plays of this period, this is a late Georgian play, not as it is often called a restoration play. It has one or two overlaps with the theatre of the restoration, but that's a 100 years before. So it's as far away from restoration drama as we are from the theatre of Noel Coward and Oscar Wilde. This is mass market entertainment for a middle class audience written for large 2000 seat theatres. There are two plots, they intertwine. One is the story of Kate and Marlowe and Mr. Hardcastle. Mr. Hardcastle, from his first marriage, has a daughter called Kate. They are fond of each other. It's a pleasant, healthy, cheerful father-daughter relationship. He has arranged for her a visit from an eligible young man called Charles Marlowe, who is the son of his long-term best friend. Kate and Marlowe have never met. Marlowe is eligible in every possible way, with one exception, which is that he becomes terribly shy and tongue-tied in the company of beautiful women of his own class. And he stutters and stammers and cannot look them in the eye and cannot talk to them. It's a bit of an obstacle to actually finding your partner, I suppose. It is an obstacle. And because he's been duped at the beginning of the play, just as Goldsmith was, into believing that he's not in the house of his intended beloved, but in a pub... Kate realises this. Kate is quick thinking. She realises that, oh, if he thinks this is a pub, he probably thinks I'm the barmaid. (laughs) She disguises herself as the barmaid. And as the barmaid, she seduces him and therefore stoops to conquer. And he's very happy to be seduced because he's able to talk to barmaids in the way that he's not able to talk to higher class ladies. Absolutely right. And so that gives them an opportunity to pursue a romance. And then gradually, obviously, she has to lift the veil and reveal her true identity. That is one half of the plot. The other half of the plot is about the Lumpkins, the other family. So you have the Hardcastles and the Lumpkins. So you have Mrs. Hardcastle, also on her second marriage, who was originally married to a man called Lumpkin. He's now died. She has a son called Tony Lumpkin. He was a kind of prankster, a sort of puckish, naughty figure. He's the one who initiates this whole plot about the pub deception. And Mrs. Hardcastle is trying to ensure that some diamonds that belong to her niece or her ward, Constance, end up in the family. So she is trying to secure a marriage between her son, Tony, and his cousin, Constance, because then that way the cash will stay in the family. She's actually being perfectly smart about that because there is every risk that when Kate, her husband's daughter, gets married, Hardcastle Hall, where she lives, will end up with the Marlows and she will be out looking for a new <laughs> looking for a new role in life. So she's trying to keep the cash. But her antagonist is a figure from London called Hastings, who is Marlowe's best friend, and he's come up to the country to woo Constance. So if Constance and Hastings can get away together, then Mrs. Hardcastle will lose all her cash. So you've got these two plots. They intertwine. You've got four lovers in the centre and the girls are best friends with each other and the boys are best friends with each other. So it's a beautifully structured plot. And the two plots kind of snake around each other until they're finally all joined up at the end. That's great. So the critics initially thought that the whole ruse about the pub was implausible, but that they also thought perhaps that the character Marlowe, who is unable to speak to high class ladies, was also somewhat implausible because he is paralyzed with shyness, isn't he? But is there some sort of origin or truth perhaps that comes from Goldsmith himself, who was not particularly a success with the ladies, as I understand it? Yes, I think that's true. But I think there is a kind of truth written into the Marlowe character, which is that, of course, many people have something of a split personality. Many people would like to think of themselves as one sort of person, but then get into a situation and become a different sort of person. Many people are more confident in certain situations. So in rehearsal, we talked about things like holiday romances and the trope of people going, well, while I'm away. Whereas if they feel more under the microscope of social observation, then they are much shyer. In Marlowe's case, this is all taken to a kind of pathological extreme. Yeah. Says at the beginning of the play to his friend Hastings, I don't believe that I've ever been familiarly acquainted, i.e. well acquainted, with a single modest woman. And then he adds, except my mother. Right. 
I think we are to in, infer from this that his mother is no more. And there is some kind of wound or scar there that he's, you know, he's got himself into a situation where he pedestalizes and elevates women of his own class. He says, to me, a modest woman dressed out in all her finery is the most tremendous object of the whole creation. You know, while other people are talking about burning mountains and extraordinary feats of nature, that to me is an overwhelming sight and he can't handle it. I think he says he's had very little exposure, hasn't he? He basically has hardly ever met any, I think. Yes. I mean, he's he's lived as many men of the time did in a homosocial world. He's been to school and university and now he's a, a lawyer practicing at the Inns of Court and he doesn't meet a lot of women of his own class on a casual basis. I also think that's an excuse. Yes, it does appear to be. It's more of a psychological impediment, it appears. Absolutely. Yeah. I was going to ask you about the title, actually, Tom, because I believe that She Stoops to Conquer was not the play's original title. In fact, it was called The Mistakes of the Night. And it was called that right up until the day of its first performances. And a lot of mistakes are certainly made, I guess, in the play. But what do you think Goldsmith intended to signify by changing the title, this title? I don't know if he just thought it was a better title. I think probably it is a better title. It's got a bit more specificity to it, hasn't it? I suppose, you know, lots of sitcoms could be called The Mistakes of a Night. It's almost Mr. Hardcastle's final line in the play. Tomorrow, the mistakes of the night will be crowned with a merry morning. I think She Stoops to Conquer has a bit more toughness about it as a title. It is, of course, both she's. There's Kate and there's Constance. So in each half of the plot... There is a she who is stooping to conquer. Constance is stooping by pretending to be in love with her cousin, Tony, while trying to effect an escape with her true love, Hastings. I suppose it has some suggestion of social commentary, though, doesn't it? About the satire on class to some degree, of course, because as you mentioned in the plot, she adopts the persona of a barmaid in order to attract Marlowe. And of course, I suppose, as you say, it focuses on the women as well. The title would signal that it's that women are the center of the thing as opposed to anybody making these mistakes. Yes, that's absolutely right. It's the women who take the initiative in each plot and the men who respond to them or simply sometimes follow in their footsteps or inspired by these by these two women who know exactly what they want. Yes, exactly. So that's all true. On the class thing, yes, it is very much a play about class. It's also a play about the self-imposed restrictions that come with being middle class in this period. You know, that means buying into a culture of politeness. Politeness, a more meaningful term in this period than it is to us now. It's a sort of whole way of thinking and being, a kind of urbane polish, which also means not imposing yourself on other people, not tiring somebody with your company, not talking too much, not being too forceful with your politics or your views, allowing everybody the space in a conversation to excel. Tom, it sounds like we could use some of this politeness, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a contested term. It's a term from the coffee houses, from the periodicals, from everybody reading, you know, magazines like The Spectator. And it's a sort of utopian ideal. It, of course, is limited because it's really a middle class phenomenon. Right. And one of the things that the play is doing is poking a bit of fun at what happens when politeness goes too far and becomes restrictive. Yes. One of the elements I was interested in in the play, and I was very struck in your production, which works really effectively, is that there are moments when several of the characters speak directly to the audience in what the stage directions identify as asides. Why do you think Goldsmith includes these? What is the purpose of those or the effect of those? Well, he includes them simply because it's an absolute convention of playwriting of this period that you can chat to the audience whenever you want to. But what it exposes in a play like this is the difference between what you mean and what you say. And it means that the audience can be in on various jokes. So it allows him to keep reminding the audience of the true situation and very economically, with no use of subtext really at all, he can just have a character turn to the audience and say, right, I'm changing tactics here. You know? <laughs> yeah. So there's a moment where Kate comes in in the second half of the play. She realises that Marlowe has begun to work out that it's not a pub. She says to the audience, I believe he begins to find out his mistake, but it's too soon quite to undeceive him. And she then proceeds to tell him a different pack of lies, where she goes, OK, I'm not the barmaid, I'm I'm somebody else, but I'm still not who you think I am. I'm a poor relation. 
I'm a poor relation of the family, exactly. And that is maintained all the way through. It's a very easy way of characters having contact with the audience. It's, of course, a delight to do that in a theatre in the round, because you've always got audience close to you. So in our production, sometimes, literally, one of the actors will simply turn to the audience member who is closest to them, or they tend to identify audience members who look friendly (laughs) and just have a word with them. You know, you can identify certain allies in the crowd. It's a lovely device. It's interesting you talk about the expectations of Georgian theatre, because I was quite struck when I was reading that, and you mentioned earlier, that Covent Garden Theatre held like 2,000 people. And generally, the behaviour in the audiences of the time was not the kind of respectful silence we're used to or would like this day and age. There was quite a lot of hubbub going on and possibly even interchanges. The audience would make their feelings known. So I guess there is some kind of interplay goes on and that's expected in that theatre. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely right. And of course, it's before the era where you would turn the house lights off. So the house lights will be on, the audience is lit. We're still in the era of a kind of apron or thrust stage, not quite like the Restoration Theatre, but there's an element of the stage projecting forward in front of the proscenium. So this is not uh, what you might think of in a Victorian theatre. That is all about framing the action within a kind of picture frame. This is not that. A great deal of the action will be played in front of that frame. And what sits inside the frame is really describing where it's happening, but the juicy parts of the action would take place in front of it. And that, of course, allows you a very direct, easy relationship with the audience. Yeah, it provides great engagement, of course. And as you say, it is brilliant in assisting with exposition and telling us what the characters think and painting a picture of the character as well. On which point, let's talk a bit more about some of these characters. Actually, I wanted first to take a moment to revel in the wonderful names that Goldsmith comes up with in this cast of characters. They're great on the ear, aren't they? And fantastically evocative. Do you have some favorites? There's a whole list. I was going to actually read some of these, but do you have some favorites? Well, I mean, the great kind of fissure of the play is between Hardcastle and Lumpkin, isn't yeah. it? You know, that Mr. and Mrs. Hardcastle, he's always been a Hardcastle. She used to be a Lumpkin. <laughs> and that tells you a lot about her social pretensions. You know, she, she's come from a slightly different world. And she's made her way upwards on the social ladder. And her son, Tony Lumpkin, he comes from the earth in some way, doesn't he? Absolutely. But what's interesting about that in terms of the town and the country is that, of course, actually, time and time again, the country people prove themselves to be the cleverer. Yes, absolutely. In a restoration play 100 years before, I think it would be conventional really for the town people to go to the country perhaps and encounter real country folk who might be quite dim who might come out with blunderbusses and threaten them away from their houses not at all the case here time and time again the country people are able to run rings around the fancy folk from town and tony does his association perhaps with the country bumpkin but actually he is smarter and more sardonic than that as well isn't he But some of the others, that even just some of the minor characters, the locals in the pub are Dick Muggins, Jack Slang, Tom Twist, and Bet Bouncer. And Marlowe carouses with ladies in the club in the city, Mrs. Mantrap, Lady Betty Blackleg, the Countess of Sligo, Mrs. Langhorns, and old Miss Biddy Buckskin. I think he's had some fun making those names up anyway. Yeah, when you say making them up, it's interesting because I think Marlowe's story that he hangs out with all of these ladies with these extraordinary names, Ah. when you put it under the slightest pressure, I suspect would dissolve. I'm not sure any of those women are real at all, you know. And certainly in the way that Freddie Fox plays the part, if you watch him during that section, you can see that he is wildly grasping for names and just making stuff (laughs) up. Because he's trying to impress a girl. You know, he literally looks at the horn of the gramophone as he comes up with long horns, et cetera, et cetera. So he, there's an element of bravado there, I think. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yes. Well, he turns on this act as the Lothario, doesn't he? Because he has this dual nature in theory. But it's very interesting that you suggest that that might all be spurious as well. We talked earlier about Goldsmith maybe representing himself in some degree in Marlowe because Goldsmith himself was uncomfortable and unsuccessful with society ladies, apparently, and more at home with women from a lower social status. 
But another part of them may be the social misfit and disruptor that is Tony Lumpkin, I think, as well. Because Goldsmith, again, also never really fit in in English class society entirely. Coming from Ireland, he didn't lose his Irish accent, apparently, deliberately. He was quite outspoken. And we'll come to talk about Tony. Let's start with Marlowe, though. He's not the usual romantic lead, is he? No, I suppose in the wake of the Restoration Theatre, there are two or three male types. You know, in the Restoration Theatre, you have the figure of the rake. uh, You have the figure of the fop. uh, The rake, someone hell-bent on pursuing his own pleasure. Quite often violently, the fop, someone who's really (laughs) trying to be the rake and failing and therefore going about with ever higher heels and more and more ribbons and a longer and longer wig to compensate for his lack of prowess and achievement. Those types have been greatly eroded a hundred years later by the time we get to She Stoops to Conquer, but there is something of the attempted rake or the failed rake about Marlowe, which emerges in the scenes where he thinks that Kate is the barmaid. He never convinces in that role. We're never meant to take him seriously, you know. I think we're always meant to understand that, yes, although he changes character and becomes a great deal more confident, it's so outrageous. And his frantic grasping for chatter is so brazen that he's a very unconvincing rake. So, no, he's not a kind of dashing romantic hero. He's certainly not a sentimental hero. But he grows as the play goes on. Uh And these two halves of his character gradually become reconciled and he becomes a more complete man. That's true. It's very interesting that you have that interpretation. And I I see this more clearly now when I think of your production and Freddie Fox's performance, that he is a failed rake as opposed to being a real rake. Because as a real rake, it's not very attractive, some of what he gets up to, right? Especially with our 21st century view of things, not very edifying. He brags to Hastings that Kate the barmaid will be his and he'll not rob her of her honor. He'll simply pay for it and things like that. Yes, I think I cut that line, actually, about the paying. I don't think that's in ours. Yeah, I mean, something we haven't mentioned, and perhaps this is straying off topic, but but our production is set in the 1930s, and Marlowe and Hastings come from the world, really, of, of Jeeves and Worcester. And as in the novels of P.G. Woodhouse, most of those novels tend to revolve around a plot in which a man is attempting not to get married. You know, (laughs) Bertie Worcester likes his bachelor life. He likes his friends. He doesn't necessarily have a problem with women. He has lots of women friends. Some of his friends are terrified of women, it must be said, and become very tongue-tied in their presence. But Bertie is constantly in flight from women who want to marry him. So one of the many reasons for moving it into the 30s was to address and make comprehensible exactly the sexual politics that you're referring to, to put it into a world where we understand that this flight from marriage is essentially a benign and that Marlowe and Hastings are not people who who mean harm. And in Freddie's performance, it's very clear, I think, that when he is boasting to his friend of his success with the barmaid, He's literally jumping up and down like a little boy. You know. <laughs> and he hasn't got very far either at that point anyway. He hasn't got very far at all. <laughs> There's a very filthy joke about embroidery, which clearly means something else, which is up to the audience to decide what it might mean. I think they got it, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he and Kate have a long exchange about embroidery and whether she might let him see her embroidery. And he says, memorably, I embroider. And then he's going back to his friend Hastings as if they're both 12, going, she talked of letting me see her embroidery above stairs. You know, (laughs) this is not a rake you're looking at. This is an excited boy. But if he's a child, then, as you said, he does grow up to some degree during the play. And that's part of the point. In particular, Kate educates him. Absolutely. And they're interchanged. And coming to Kate, this is a gift of a role for an actor as well, isn't it? To play the different class characters, the Kate Harcastle, the daughter and the barmaid and the poor relation. It must be great fun to do that part. It's a lot of fun. And Tanya Reynolds has a huge amount of fun doing it. You know, clearly this is in the line of those great Shakespearean heroines. You know, you think perhaps particularly of Rosalind, 
in As You Like It. And yeah. the way that Rosalind goes into the Forest of Arden and then kind of trains Orlando, puts Orlando on a kind of education course so that he becomes a worthy partner and tests him until she's confident that he's up to the job. Kate does a very similar thing. I think it's also true that Kate also grows up during the play. Mm -hmm. This act of stooping and inhabiting a different social role. Kate is really able to mediate between classes and move easily between different social spheres. And she enjoys it. You know, she's a performer. And I think she acquires a kind of liberty through playing the barmaid. Definitely that she would never have in her normal life. She too, of course, has a split life, which is worth talking about, because at the very beginning of the play, we realise that she and her dad have done a kind of deal whereby in the daytime, she is allowed to dress in her own manner. That is incredibly extravagantly. You know, she's clearly ordering dresses from all the fanciest London tailors and going around in the daytimes in fancy evening wear. <laughs> but then in the evenings, she puts on her plain housewife's dress to please her father, who likes more old fashioned values. Critics of the original production were slightly unconvinced by the truthfulness of such a deal. I think it's a bit of play acting and she enjoys it. She enjoys inhabiting different modes. Yeah. And so the opportunity to play the barmaid, that's really fun for Kate and she gets space that she wouldn't normally be allowed. You're absolutely right. It's liberating for her. I think it's pretty obvious that to some degree she's rather stuck in the country, isn't she? And there are not many options for her amusement or for encounters with men either. She says we don't meet many such at a horse race in the country and referring to Marlowe and this opportunity of potentially marrying him. And although, you know, it's essentially arranged by her father and Marlowe's father, she does take some initiative and exercises some agency within this scenario as well. And as you say, I mean, what starts as a bit of a romantic adventure or a jape or something becomes more real for her. And in fact, I don't know, this might be going too far, Tom, but when she's playing the barmaid and Marlowe's playing the low rent version of himself, the Lothario, is there some sort of charge between them? Doesn't she actually think, oh, I might quite like this in a way that she wouldn't otherwise have any exposure to? Oh, no, I don't think you're projecting that in any way at all. That is absolutely there. They have a lot of fun when they are in their disguises. And, you know, it's an old theatrical device, isn't it? Which Shakespeare exploits time and time again. The Restoration Theatre, perhaps a little less so, but still goes in for that kind of thing. Yeah, they have fun while they are being other people. And then her job is gently to restore that to the real world and make sure that it can endure in the real world as well. Which she does very effectively. And as she says, actually, throughout when her father talks to her initially about Marlowe being a modest man and all that, she she sort of goes, yeah, well, that's all very well. But throughout most of it, she wants to cure him of timidity. She does actually want a man of some passion. Oh, completely. She says at the beginning, well, I like all this stuff about him being handsome and smart. And I like all this stuff about him having good manners. But I'm really not into this thing of him being timid. That is not my thing at all. Yeah, yeah. And as you say, the comparison with Rosalind is fabulous. She is spirited and smart and self-assured, and she's in disguise for some of this thing. Constance, the other woman who you said also stoops to conquer to some degree, different character, more straightforward in some ways, more worldly, I guess, in a way, and a schemer by necessity being the dependent downtrodden niece. She has to work hard to get what she needs. Yes. I mean, certainly by the time we've rolled it forward into the 1930s, Constance is a new woman, isn't she? You know, she's clearly come for the weekend. She has some kind of London life. There is a reference in the play, which we've lent on quite heavily, where she says to Kate, there's a reference to when we lived in town. So Kate and Constance have spent time living in town. In the 1930s, that starts to make even more sense. You imagine that they would be, you know, a pair of ladies sharing a flat. You know, one of them's got a job working for a publisher or whatever. You know, they're having a good time. Yes. So these are quite sophisticated women who know what they want. They have a level of education. We know that they're literate. They read. And yeah, each woman drives her own plot. In our production, and perhaps this is as much us as it is Goldsmith, 
Constance is the good time girl, really, you know, and Constance and Hastings, who are very much an established couple, have clearly a really fun romance going on in London and, you know, have a good time. You're right, I think, in saying that she and the women drive the relationships. I mean, because in the end, actually, she's the one that calls it because when they're going to elope and they've lost the jewels, too complicated to go through all of the movements of the jewels, but suffice to say that they're left without the jewels that they hope to run away with. And Hastings is all for carrying on and just running away anyway. And she goes, no, 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 hang on. We need to be sensible, ever prudent, she says. And in the end, she effectively manages that situation. And you imagine her managing Hastings as well as they go off into their life. Oh, she's going to manage Hastings for the rest of his life, and he'll be very grateful. (laughs) Yes, so we should. Let's come to Tony Lumpkin, we talked about earlier, who's a a disruptive foil to some degree to these genteel characters. And you said the country boy who gets one over on the city types. I thought what was important about his position is that he seems to have a freedom to roam between classes. He's born into the gentry, but he's very happy consorting with the peasants in the pub. He's a bit of a Falstaffian character, although nothing like as old or as fat, of course. But he has a foot in both camps, doesn't he? It's absolutely true. I mean, his father, we hear, was a real regular in the pub. Old Squire Lumpkin was the finest gentleman I ever set my eyes on, says somebody in the pub. He kept the best horses, dogs and girls in the whole country. Yeah. So clearly, you know, he comes from very naughty Lumpkin stock. And his dad was a very popular figure. That's evident. And when we see him in the Three Pigeons pub, his status is Guy high, you know, he's the kind of god of that pub, really. And he pays for drinks with money that we later learn he's stolen from his mum's desk. <laughs> and he then has to go back to Hardcastle Hall, where his stepfather, Mr. Hardcastle, is not terribly impressed with him. No. He is the apple of his mother's eye. He is spoiled. We're told that over and over and over again, that she, Mrs. Hardcastle, Mrs. Lumpkin, as was jokes on him. And so he's infantilized, really. Mr. Hardcastle thinks he's a bit of a waste of space, of course, doesn't he? Absolutely. Yeah. And as the stepson, I guess he feels hard done by in that context, which is why presumably he seeks relief in the pub. Indeed. We learn that he's illiterate because his mother always thought that too much schooling might make him sick. Thinking that it's unnecessary for a boy provided with 1500 a year. (laughs) Yeah. Why would he need education? As in so many parts of this play, if you wanted to do a really dark production, you know, Marlowe's behaviour is tremendously problematic in a whole number of ways. Mrs. Hardcastle's treatment of her son is a form of Munchausen syndrome. She's infantilized and convinced him that he's ill and so on and so on. Of course, that production is there for the doing, if you want to. And Tony's actions could be really bitter. Absolutely. Yeah. I, in truth, don't think that is the play that Goldsmith wrote. No. But I know there have been productions in the rich history of producing this play that have delved more into those darker things. I just think it's not really the play. What about Tony's treatment of his mother and the character of Mrs. Harcastle? He's pretty cruel to his mother, particularly in this crazy scene where they head off into the night and he dupes them into thinking that they're traveling 30 or 40 miles by coach, but they're actually just going around in circles and end up in the bottom of their own garden in the horse pond. And he speaks to her pretty uh, aggressively in that scene. So he's not very nice. She's not very nice to him either. She hasn't dealt very fairly with him either. So I guess it seems all fair in love and war, does it? Yes. I also think those two characters are constantly at each other's throats and then constantly forgiving each other. You know, they have terrible rows and then the next moment they're literally tickling each other. You know, (laughs) it's a dysfunctional mother-son relationship, which is ended at the end of the play because he's told that he is finally of age, which in fact he has been for a little while. But she's, she's denied him the knowledge of his own age. So I think they each give as good as they get. Yeah. Okay. I think it's pretty hard to like her. She's vain with these social pretensions. She nags her husband, deceives her son, bullies her niece, greedy for this wealth and social status. But I don't know. Is there any redeeming features for Mrs. Hardcastle? Well, the only thing about Mrs. Hardcastle is follow the money, you know, as we might think about Mrs. Bennett 
in Pride and Prejudice a little later, what is it that is motivating these people, usually women, in writing of this period, to be avaricious and to be so very keen for people to make good marriages? It's the fact they have nothing of their own. There is no economy that supports Mrs. Hardcastle except through entailed and inherited wealth. So if she gets this wrong, she's screwed. You know, this is her one roll of the dice. So she does have to get it right. That's a fair point. So yes, we'll leave that one a fair point on her behalf. What about Mr. Hardcastle? It's a wonder to some degree that he stays with her, I suppose, but he he does seem to love her, doesn't he? And he may be a bit of an old fashioned bore to some degree, but he's got a good heart, doesn't he? Mr. Hardcastle is a glorious collection of contradictions, isn't he? Because at the beginning of the play, we're very clearly told everything about her is sort of newfangled and everything about him is old fashioned. And he gives a speech within a minute of the play starting about how he loves all the old things, old wine, old books, old friends, and so on. But in fact, he, like his daughter Kate, oscillates between different modes of behaviour. You know, he spends quite a lot of the first half of the play talking about modesty and how he wishes that the young men of today would be more modest very 18th century concept but by the second half of the play he's going well look i like modesty in its place well enough but you're now going much too far (laughs) and he becomes rather naughty and is absolutely desperate for people just to speak their minds and get off the fence so he's a lovely contradiction he can be very irascible you know he can be an old boar telling endless stories of military history from times gone by but he's clearly a very loving father You said an arranged marriage a few minutes ago. Yeah, but he does say, doesn't he, to her that he wouldn't insist she can control her choice. Absolutely. And that's terribly important, that line and that little conversation. I think, again, if you think of it in 1930s terms in this production, you go, this is much more like really a date that they have been set up on. You know, come for the weekend, spend some time together, see how it goes, than it is like a kind of forcibly arranged marriage. Yeah, definitely. And that line is absolutely important. And it tells about the relationship they do have, which is more equal, I think. Yeah. And he's actually, in the end, relatively enlightened. He has an enlightened view about Constance's circumstances. And when he's asked to judge on those, and, you know, it's irascibility. He's pretty hard put upon (laughs) by his wife and his stepson and the visitors who treat his home as an inn. It's fair enough, his reaction, I would have said. Absolutely. Yeah. And beautifully played, by the way, in your production by David Horovich. Very, very funny. We mentioned at the beginning that the play is a comedy. It does provide great entertainment, but he also brings to it a slightly satirical perspective on class. What's going on in Britain at the time that he's referencing and what does he have to say about class, do you think, in the play? Yeah, I mean, there's no sense in which this is a significant attack on the class system. You know, this is not a political play. Uh, You know, he has no consciousness of Marx coming over the hill. You know, there's nothing like that. But I think what he's interested in is the different social restrictions of different class. He has, I think, a really deep respect for the manners and moralities of the countryside. He applies a kind of keen satirical eye to the pretensions of the town. So there's probably as much here about town and country as there is about what we would call probably the middling sort, the middle classes and the country classes. Well, it's associated, isn't it? What you said earlier, I think, about the uh, industrialization, urbanization in late 18th century Britain. Isn't it that the fabric of these societies are changing because of the economics? And that creates increased social mobility as well, which perhaps makes it harder, by definition, to define traditional class identities, who is who, where have they come from. And there's some of that goes on in the play, of course. Well, what you just said is terribly important because class codes become hard to read in the play. Because Mr. Hardcastle is old fashioned and his house is old fashioned, these two posh boys from London arrive and think it is a pub. I mean, okay, they've been duped and set up, but to them it looks like a pub. What to Mr. Hardcastle are the kind of social codes of a certain kind of upper class country life look to the town boys like a kind of rural poverty? Because they go, you know, in our 1930s world, they're thinking, God, you don't have central heating, you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. where, where are your carpets? Are you on the phone? Yes, exactly. 
So the old fashionedness reads to them like something else. Whereas, in fact, what you've got is a kind of, in our production, a sort of man of mid-Victorian temperament who's still around in 1930. I guess there is something when Kate puts on the the role of being the poor relation or the barmaid. And I mean, Marlowe comes to a view that he fancies this girl and thinks, oh, I would like to have a relationship with her. But there's a difference in our birth, our fortune education he says, make an honorable connection impossible. So there's still some restrictions about class, of course, in terms of making a proper marriage. Absolutely right. And Marlow comes to feel increasingly trapped by his class because he's fallen in love with someone who, as he perceives it, is of a different class. And when he says honorable connection, he means, you know, I suppose I could, in theory, seduce this person. In theory, we could sleep together, but, but we couldn't get married and we, we couldn't build a life together. And that is why I have to go. One of the great things, though, is, isn't it, Tom, that he comes to a view that he will do this anyway. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so this is the sentiment part of the play. This is the man of fine feeling who has grown up enormously from the man who we met in the first act of the play, who is going all these things, you know, the opinion of my friends and wealth and class and what my dad thinks. He's very, very interested all the way through in what his dad thinks. All of these things begin to lose their weight and I am undone, he says. So that's the romantic story doing its thing. Which is perfect. We're coming towards the ending. And you mentioned earlier that Mrs. Hardcastle talks about the ending as if it's the whining end of a modern novel. She's the only one who doesn't think this is a happy ending in some way, I guess. But what do you make of this? Is this a sentimental ending? But is he wrapping everything up in an ironic way? Oh, no, I think he's fully embracing it. You know, we've we've had our laughs along the way. But actually, it is a romantic comedy as well as a situation comedy. And so we are supposed to be invested in that relationship at the end. And for all that we've had a lot of laughs along the way, there is the pleasure that you get at the end of a good rom-com in seeing the figures who have been held apart by the plot and by circumstance and by their own psychologies coming together at the end. And I think we're supposed to take that seriously in, in some respect. Yeah, so we take seriously that Marlowe's grown up a bit. But I also think we also love the fact that Kate seems to be running the show. There's a stage direction that says they retire, she tormenting him. So I feel like she's easily his equal, of course, and she's engineered the whole thing and educated him to this point. There's truth comes out, though, isn't it, really? He becomes honest. Ironically, in the dissembling, you could say they found honest grounds for their relationship. Absolutely. And as he proposes marriage to her, he calls her his little tyrant. <laughs> you know, and it comes out sounding like a kind of pet name. And they'll live happily ever after. <laughs> yeah, yeah. In that vein. Yes, that's great. Tom, thank you. We've come to a good point to end, I think. Before I let you go, one of the traditions of the podcast is I like to ask my guests to recommend another play that we might cover at some point or actually just one that's a personal favorite. Now, I ask this question to a lot of people. I know it's iniquitous to ask a director of a theater to favor a play. But, you know, just off the top of your head, if you could share one play that you love. Well, I was thinking about a production that I'd seen recently because at the weekend I caught a new play by Annie Baker at the National Theatre. It's called Infinite Life, a beautiful production by James MacDonald, who I think is one of our very finest directors at the moment. And it's really quite exquisitely handled. It's a story about women and pain and the experience of long-term pain. And it's a very quiet play. It's a play filled with pause and silence. And it could be a very bleak play, but it's actually a very funny, tender, rather gorgeous piece of writing I would recommend. It's a great recommendation. I saw it on Friday night, as it happens. And yes, I'm an Annie Baker fan. And you say bleak. Actually, I found it quite disturbing because uh, these characters are all suffering in one form or another from ill health and trying to find solutions to that. And in our age, this becomes a very dominant part of how we think about our existence and whether we can live forever, which we can't, of course, and in what form. Um, but it's a great recommendation. Thank you, Tom, so much for joining me today. It's been really fun. And your production is huge fun. Tom's production of She Stoops to Conquer continues at the Orange Street Theatre until the 13th of January. So don't miss it. As you said at the beginning, it's a great seasonal treat. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. As the curtain falls on the two happy couples, perhaps it could be said that the lovers of all stoop to conquer, in the sense that 
To secure their happiness, they have had to shed any social arrogance or pretenses, and in humility and honesty, found their true heart's course. That sounds like a fine feeling and a good ending to a sentimental comedy to me. Thanks for listening. See you next time. There are additional footnotes about this and every other play that we cover in the podcast available to our patrons. Patrons also enjoy early access to our sister podcast, The Play Review, in which Jody Rylett and I share our views on current productions on the London stage. To become a patron, please visit our website at theplaypodcast.com. And don't forget to follow us wherever you listen to podcasts so as not to miss an episode. Thank you again for listening. See you next time.